Hey there, entrepreneurs. My name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives and thought leaders and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Wiley Robinson to the show. Wiley is the founder and CEO of Rumpel. Rumpel creates everyday blankets and bedding items out of technical materials commonly found in outdoor gear and activewear. And today I want to ask Wiley a few questions about his entrepreneurial story and some of the strategies and tactics that he has used to start and grow his business. So thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, Wiley, and, and for joining uh, today at Trep Talks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. So <clears throat> I know I read uh, the startup story of Rumpel on your website. Uh, it's an interesting story. So um, I would really, I'd really appreciate if you could share you know, how did you get the idea for Rumpel and um, yeah, what were, you know, what was the motivation behind it? Sure. Uh, so the idea for Rumpel, um, the idea being to create a blanket out of more technical materials started in 2012. Uh, I was on a ski trip with a friend of mine um, and we were sleeping in our car and planning on skiing the next day. And that night it, it, was the coldest night on record in this location where we were. It was just outside Mammoth, California. And we woke up the next morning and our car was completely frozen and wouldn't start. So we had to climb into our sleeping bags and hang out there and wait for somebody to come and help us. We were too far away to walk into town. We didn't have any cell service. So we pretty much had to wait around. And during that time while we were waiting, we both started talking about how the materials in our sleeping bags were just so much better at keeping us warm and comfortable than our blankets back home. So we decided that we wanted to make what we called a sleeping bag blanket. And um, that was kind of the original idea for the product. Um, when we finally got out of there and got back home to San Francisco, which is where we were living at the time, we went to a local fabric store, picked up some technical material and some, or technical nylon rather, and some uh, you know insulation, some synthetic insulation that we would use for this first prototype and created the first two what would be rumples. Um, that was kind of the end of it. And then a number of our friends said that this is a really interesting idea. You know, I think I'd like to have one of these. So we decided to turn to Kickstarter and actually launch the product and the brand on Kickstarter. And that ended up being really successful. And that kind of told us that this was a viable idea. So you never really started out thinking about this, that, you know, that there could be a business out of it. It was more or less an accident. Could you share, what were you doing before starting Rumpel? Like, what was your background? Were you always entrepreneurial? Uh, my background, no, it, it hasn't been. Uh, my background has always been in creative fields. Uh, I worked at a number of agencies before starting Rumpel. Um, I actually have a degree in architecture. That was where I was originally intended to go. Um, but uh, after working for a couple of years in the field, I realized that it wasn't for me. And I decided to kind of migrate my, my creative focus to branding and graphic design. I did quite a bit of environments design, trade shows, retail spaces, things like that. Um, and I was working at an agency when we went on the ski trip and, and quit the agency to start Rumble. So you actually decided to, to quit your day job to, to start uh, Rumble. Uh, was there any fear that, you know, if the business did not work out, you know, how are you, how are you going to manage the finances and things like that? Because a lot of times when I hear uh, some of the successful entrepreneurs, they say, you know, if you want to start a business, uh, keep your day job or, or, you know, continue doing what you're doing and, and start it as a side thing. And then once you have like enough cash flow generating, uh, then, then, then quit the job. What is your perspective on that? Uh, that's definitely better advice than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would say that, that there's probably a, um, there's a point at which you really do need to go all in and quit your job. Um, I, I did that early. So I quit my job four or five months before the Kickstarter even went live, which in hindsight was a little bit reckless, um, probably a little bit irresponsible of me to do, but I was pretty passionate about the idea and really had conviction that it was gonna do well. Um, and I was kind of burnt out at the agency. I was there for over four years and ready for something new. So I decided to focus all of my attention on building this new product and new brand. Um, now, that being said, I would definitely encourage uh, anybody starting a business to show some proof of concept before quitting their day job. Before you have any you know, idea that there's gonna be traction or that there's actual demand built up for what you're creating, uh, it's good to have a paycheck and have some security. Um, now, once you do establish that there's demand and you do establish that, that uh, you can actually make this a business, I think that's right when you quit your job because 
if you elect to, you know, go out and raise money or you talk to people that, you know, you might want to partner with, they're not going to take you that seriously if you've also got a day job. Um, so I think that, that you probably should do somewhere in the middle of what I did, um, which is make sure that you have a, a viable idea. And once that's, once that's proven, then it's time to quit your job and go all in. And, and as you're saying um, about having a proof of concept, so for you, the proof of concept first was that your friends were interested in this product. And then when you put it on the Kickstarter, I think your Kickstarter campaign was really, really successful. Can you share a little bit about uh, the success of Kickstarter? Was it completely organic or did you actually have to market uh, the Kickstarter page and things like that? Um, how, did, how did it get so successful? Our first one was completely organic. Um, my partner and I, we, we, and this was my friend who I went on the trip with. He was my business partner in the formation of Rumpel. Um, he and I pretty much just posted on our own social media accounts. Uh, and, you know, between the two of us, we had a very, very small reach, relatively very small reach. Um, maybe a couple thousand people, maybe. Um, we, we got really lucky in that uh, we actually got picked up by some pretty major press right away. Um, and that was largely due to just a lot of cold emails that I was sending. I would go on LinkedIn and I would find anybody that I was, was a contributing writer to, you know, any major media and, and send them an email. I probably sent, you know, several hundred emails um, before anybody wrote back and said, yeah, I think this is an interesting thing to cover. Of course, when the Kickstarter campaign ended up getting some traction and, and becoming this successful thing, more people wanted to cover it and more people became interested. So it's sort of this snowball where, you know, you kind of start out with absolutely no, no traction whatsoever, um, totally organic word of mouth. And then once a couple of media hits happen, more press happens, more, more backers come through and, and it really just kind of takes off in that way. But starting so when, that engine up was, was completely organic. So when, when reaching out to press, like, uh, for PR, you know, they, they're always looking for an angle, right? Um, for your product, what was the angle? What was the value proposition? How did you sell it to them? Because, you know, when you think about it, if, if you just talk about, you know, it's a blanket, but it's with a different kind of a material, um, maybe maybe, maybe it's, it does not come across like a story, story worthy uh, thing. Sure. How did, you, how, how did you sell it to people? Yeah, we, we really went for kind of like the classic problem solution narrative where our problem was blankets are this really dated category that have been around for hundreds of years, but very, very little material innovation has been applied to this category. And meanwhile, over in outdoor gear and athletic apparel, all this textile innovation is happening and none of that has flown through into this blanket category. So the problem was there's this nascent, age old, ubiquitous category that everybody participates in that hasn't had any upgrades and it, and it deserves an upgrade because these new technical materials will do a much better job performing than cottons or wools or whatever else blankets are typically made out of. And the solution was taking technologies from outdoor gear and athletic apparel and applying them to this dated category. And, and does, this, does this apply to like, who's, who's the target audit? Is it like, your, is your blanket uh, I'm assuming it's not like a mass product. Uh, I'm assuming it's not like, you know, people generally using it at, at home as, as a replacement for their, you know, regular, you know, cotton blanket or whatever. Uh, is, is there like a specific uh, target audience for this blanket? So the, the actual um, primary use case for Rumpel is at home. Um, it's not on the bed, but it is at home on the couch or adjacent to the home, like in the patio or in the backyard, something like that. Um, you know, people do use it, of course, for recreating, camping, backpacking, all sorts of things like that. But most commonly, it's used at home. Um, I would say that the target consumer is somebody that uh, understands technical materials. So, you know, somebody that might wear a puffer jacket to go grocery shopping or just, you know, cruising around the city wearing a, wearing a puffy jacket. That is, that is the consumer that understands that these materials actually work better at keeping you insulated and comfortable. It's a very, very broad range of consumers. <laughs> and, and when you started out uh, this technical material, this was kind of an innovation for this product. Um, do you have more competitors now since you started? Yeah, we have a lot of competitors now. Um, and they range from you know, overseas knockoffs that are sold on Amazon um, to 
big players in in the outdoor space are now making products just like ours. Patagonia just released one. Um, a number of companies have released products very, very similar to ours. Uh, I do think that what differentiates Rumpel is a couple of things. I mean, first of all, we are exclusively focused on this product category. And so for that reason, we are, we are really the experts and the pioneers in this category. So I think that says something to consumers when they look at the, the landscape of this category. Um, additionally, because we focus on the category and nothing else, we are able to go the broadest in terms of our print and design of anyone. You know, some of these other competitors that have come out, they might offer two or three or four colors, but we have many, many, many colors that you can choose from and prints and artist collaborations and brand collaborations and things like that. So the breadth and choice that, that consumers get with Rumpel is much, much broader than anyone else. And <clears throat> Can you share a little bit about the early, so, so you had this idea, you, your Kickstarter campaign worked out really well. What was the next step? So <clears throat> having your prototype, how do you bring that prototype to mass market? How do you get it mass manufactured? It, was it in the US? Did you go to a different country? We, we went to offshore manufacturing right away. Um, and the reason for that is really specifically in Asia. Um, Asia really is the, the experts in technical materials. Uh, that's where the vast majority of performance outerwear is, is produced. They have the mills, they have the cut sew expertise. It's really difficult material to work with because it's, it's slippery. Um, it's got kind of that technical, you know, ripstop feel to it and texture to it, which is really difficult to actually sew in a proficient way. So we went straight to Asia um, for, our, for our mass manufacturing. The way we found our supply chain was through some connections that uh, my, my partner and I had just in the outdoor industry, people that worked as technical designers um, at some of the larger companies. They put us in touch with a couple of people. If, if, those, if those factories couldn't produce what we wanted, they then sent us to another connection that they might have had. So it was sort of a first, second, third degree connection to some of these supply chains that we ended up working with. And we've, we've since switched to what is now our long-term partner from what we used for Kickstarter. Um, but those early days of figuring out who was going to make our stuff was definitely a big challenge. And was there ever a concern because the innovation is of the material? Did you ever try to uh, protect your intellectual property? Like, did you ever try to get a patent on this or, or things like that, where, you know, the competitors who are coming up with similar products would not be able to do so? Or was that never a concern? It, it's always a concern. Um, you know, the, the product itself can be made with a variety of different types of technical materials and to the untrained eye, they really wouldn't know the difference. Um, so there's very, very little that Rumble can actually protect in terms of our idea of using these materials for a blanket. But we can protect, of course, is our name, our logo. We do have protection over our signature stitch pattern. Um, you'll notice that the blankets all bear this stitch pattern, sort of this wavy swooping lines. That is protected. Um, now, that being said, Somebody could adjust that by you know, 30, 40% or something and probably circumnavigate our, our protection. But we feel that, that that mark is identifiable enough with Rumpel that, that, that it's worth protecting. So we've gone ahead and done that. Um, we have also developed a number of technologies that we have in some of our higher end products. We have a product called a Nano Loft Puffy Blanket. Um, that's a, a synthetic insulation made from post-consumer recycled content that we developed from the ground up. So that is proprietary to Rumpel. Um, there's obviously tons of different types of synthetic insulation, but we believe that this is one of the best ones we've ever felt. So that's another aspect that we have protected. And just out of curiosity, when you do these kind of like innovation in the material itself, do you work with like engineers or do you do specific research on materials to see, you know, what would be good for your, um, for your product? How, how does that work? Uh, so we have an incredible uh, supply chain partner, um, and they're, they're a full service trading partner where they handle all of our sourcing, all of our development, uh, all of our overseas logistics, um, and, you know, obviously they charge a little fee for that, but it's allowed us to keep our product team very, very lean. Um, and so what we do is generally we say to them, hey, we're looking for this type of material. We, we would like to accomplish this goal. Can you guys help us solve this design challenge? And they've been really good in the past at figuring these things out. They're, they're based in Asia. Um, they work with you know, several hundred cut sew houses and, and mills overseas, all over the place, actually, not just in Asia. Um, but they've been an incredible resource for us to keep our team really lean on the product side, at least. 
So they're really like your consultants. And I, I assume like when you have this kind of a request, uh, they charge some 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 fees for that, or do they ha do they ha have some sort of a licensing thing? Because it's really their idea, right? Yeah, they they have a little markup on the cost of goods. What Rumble is expert at is it's expert at defining the market problem and coming up with a creative narrative from a product standpoint for solving that. Um, so going back to the original idea, blankets are the stated category. We have this idea to introduce technical materials to this category. So we, we would give our, our trading partner some loose guidelines around what we're trying to accomplish, what we think the, the product should look and feel like, what it should stand for, what it should represent in the eyes of the customer. And then they go back and they find you know, a whole big swatch book of materials that they show us that we then approve, a whole different you know, set of installations that they think might work. And we work together on actually bringing that product to life. But our expertise is in creating narratives around those products. Okay. Um, I know that you mentioned your 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 uh, partner and co-founder uh, when you were talking before, and I also read somewhere that uh, at a certain point in, in the business you had to part ways, and and this is all you know. I, I come across these kind of stories every once in a while when I'm talking to to founders and co-founders, um, and and there's always a certain advice and you know how to you know because it's, it's always. Um, it's, it's kind of like having a marriage, right? You know, you, you have a, a, another person and you have to make sure that the values are aligned and goals are aligned and things like that. Can you share a little bit about, you know, your experience working with a co-founder? What, you know, what motivated uh, the, the shift to, to, to go apart and, and what can other founders learn, learn from it? Sure. Um, so my my co-founder, um, you know, is a very good friend, um, and uh, he and I were we just hung out a lot before Rumple. We did a lot of mountain biking and surfing and skiing and all these activities together. We were both designers, um, so we had very very complementary personalities and skill sets. Um, and ultimately, uh, the vision for the company um, that we realized was that we really wanted to be focused on blankets. When we started out, um, we thought that maybe we could take this, this design ideology of taking performance materials and applying them to a whole host of home goods. Um, you, could you could imagine, if, you know, in addition to blankets, there's sheets and towels and slippers and robes and all sorts of things that you use in the home that could be upgraded with performance materials. And he was really passionate about this idea and really thought that that was sort of the path forward for the company. But meanwhile, the, the blanket sales were just kind of going through the roof and we had to reinvest all of our, our profits into making more blankets and telling the blanket story and marketing the blankets. And so um, it was pretty clear that that's the path that the, that the company should, should get itself on is just really focusing on this category and, and spending all of our energy there. And he and I just disagreed on that. Um, and so we got to a point where it was like, this is the path forward. We, we had two employees at the time. They were, they were on board with the notion of going towards blankets and focusing on blankets, doing fewer things, but really well. Um, and that's the time when we realized that we just had to part ways. Um, so that's sort of like the story of how and why uh, my co-founder and I parted ways. I think as far as advice that I would give to anybody that needs to go through something like that, um, you know, as tough as this may be when you're in the moment, I think that it's really important to be as empathetic as possible to what your co-founder is going through, the one that's being asked to leave. I mean, for all intents and purposes, my co-founder was equally as invested in this business as I was. He was totally passionate about it. He had left his job for it, all these things. So, you know, when you're asking somebody to leave, when they've put that much commitment and that much energy into something, you really gotta be sensitive to what they're going through emotionally. Um, when, when we parted ways, uh, there was a severance package, there was a equity buyout that took place. And um, looking back on it, you know, I think that, that I and our legal team was, was really generous to my co-founder. Um, I think he would feel that way as well. It was a very fair uh, agreement that we reached um, based on where the company was at that time. And um, that was really driven from me in no way trying to like screw him over um, in any way when he was being asked to leave the business. This like very emotional thing he had been tied up with. And so that would be my advice is just to really, as best you can, put yourself in the shoes of the person being asked to leave. Okay. Uh, so can you share a little bit about in the early days? I know that when you did the Kickstarter campaign, your sales took off really quickly. Um, 
what was the reason? Was it really just that you had tapped into some sort of a, this demand in the market, unfulfilled demand, and, and people were looking for something different in the blanket space and they really took to this? Or was it that, you know, the way you positioned your business in terms of story and things like that, 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 uh, that spoke to a certain uh, segment of the market? Um, what, what, what was the, 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 the thing that you think uh, helped you to sell uh, at, at the really beginning? I definitely think it was the positioning and the story. And I still think that's what drives Rumble, actually. I don't think people are out there, you know, looking at their blanket saying, man, I really wish I could get more out of this blanket. Um, I don't think that's a, a category that people are, are focused on um, thinking about at all. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite things to do when, when I'm pitching Rumple to somebody, to a potential account or an investor or somebody we're trying to hire, is I ask them, how many blankets do you have in your household? And they'll count them out and they'll think, okay, well, wow, I probably have 15 or 20 blankets in my house. My follow-up question is always, okay, name one brand of blanket. And nobody can ever do it. You know, sometimes you get Pendleton, but generally speaking, nobody can name a single blanket brand. So all this to say, I don't think that consumers are all that focused on the category at all. It's like socks or underwear or, you know, so, something that's just sort of there and does the job well enough um, in their minds, at least, but they haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. I, I think that when we created that problem solution narrative that I was talking about, where it's like this category has been around forever, the materials haven't developed at all, all this other material technology has been developed over here. Why don't we use some of that on blankets? that's when it kind of clicks for customers and they say, huh, that makes a lot of sense. I think that, that I'd like to try something like this to see if what they're saying is actually true. And I think that's what really kind of launched the, launched the brand and, and built this, this awareness around what we were doing. Um, I definitely don't think it was the result of there being a real need at that time in the category. Okay. Uh, when, when I go on your website, like the feel that I get from your website and, and when I read the, the copy and things like that is, that this this blanket is really good geared towards like the adventure uh, young kind of crowd. Uh, has the, has your story uh, from going from a problem solution narrative ha, have you have you evolved the story, or um, or or is there a reason behind the, the the kind of feel that I get when when I visit your website? It's definitely evolved a little bit. We've definitely brought sustainability and you know caused based activities um, to the forefront of the brand. But generally speaking, the brand foundation has been very solid over the last seven years now. Um, and whether or not that is because it was just dumb luck, or I, I'd like to think that all my time spent at branding agencies helped formulate a really solid foundation. Um, but generally speaking, our brand foundation has not adjusted that much. Um, you know, I mentioned all the, all the sustainability commitments and things like that. We, tr we transitioned all of our product over to 100% post-consumer recycled two years ago now. Um, and that was a big shift that we made. Um, really challenging thing to go through in terms of uh, product development and just marketplace uh, clarity and, and all that. So um, that's something that is more forefront in the brand now than it was when we started. But generally speaking, the idea of upgrading the blanket category of performance materials is very much the, the origin story of the company. And that is something, you know, sustainability is something that is getting very popular with a lot of the brands, brands, uh, even even the bigger brands. Is that something that was a conscious choice on your part to to think from like that branding lens that, you know, in the market, you know, the uh, the story is shifting from, you know, uh, going just for profit to to going to more more towards sustainable uh, materials and environment uh, protection and things like that. Uh, was that a conscious shift or uh, did that just uh, occur because, you know, you want, you were interested in sustainability? Uh, both. I mean, I think that, that as a business owner and, and I would speak for, for our broader team, we feel a lot better about creating products that are, that are sustainably sourced. Um, additionally, you really don't have to sacrifice profits to, to do that sort of stuff. Um, our, our raw materials are roughly the same cost as the virgin materials we were paying for before we switched over. Now we do, we are 1% for the planet members, meaning we donate 1% of all sales to environmental causes. That of course does eat out of the bottom line, uh, but that's just another thing that we feel good about doing as a brand. Um, we think it's something our consumers care about and we're, we're happy and proud to do it. 
Um, and we've, we've built our margin structure and our product such that we can do things like that and still have enough profits to fuel the rest of the company. I want to change the gears a little bit and talk about Shark Tank. I know you were you appeared on Shark Tank last year, I believe. Uh, could you share a little bit about the background uh, for that? Because uh, you know I watched the YouTube video and and I think uh, one of them, I think Mark Cuban asked you how much cash you have in the bank, and you said you know three and a half million dollars. Um, can you share a little bit about the the background there of going to the Shark Tank? Was it I believe you said there that it isn't really financing, but you were looking for help with licensing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we we are actively pushing into sports licensing sales channels. Um, and we think that the use case for the product is perfect. You know, you can imagine being in a cold stadium and you've got this really light, portable, packable blanket in your backpack that you can just pull out and put on when it gets cold. So. We've, we've for a long time thought that this is a really good avenue for us to pursue. Um, now the challenge with, with sports licensing is that it's a very complicated, nuanced sales channel. Um, you know, there's, there's league minimums, there's, there's licenses that you need to acquire. Um, and there's a lot of people kind of that you have to navigate and a lot of players in that space that you have to navigate in order to get your product to market. It's a completely different margin structure than our inline business. It's really a completely different business. And um, what I said on Shark Tank, which, which is you know, still how I feel, um, all that 3.5 million that's in the bank, that's really earmarked for growth in our core channels. That's for growth in the outdoor channel, that's for growth in, growth in outdoor adjacent lifestyle type channels. Um, we've got some new interesting home and patio channels that are coming online that we need to support. Um, and so the thinking was if I went on Shark Tank with sort of this, you know, call it, call it uh, side business within Rumpel of sports licensing, um, I could really use some growth capital. And more importantly, I could use some, some partnership. As I mentioned, there's just a lot of people that, that uh, and a lot of navigation and politics you need to get through to get these licenses and to get sold into these leagues. Um, I thought, you know, partnering with someone like Mark Cuban would be a fast track through that door. Um, so that's, that's why I went on the program. Um, and Obviously, a deal was not was not struck. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or if you want your <laughs> your listeners to. Watch I, th the I think it was pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we we got a couple of offers, but I didn't want to take the offers. They weren't. I didn't think that they valued the company correctly at all. Um, and so we've since gone and we've used that three and a half million to break into the sports licensing channel, and that's going to be launching for us this fall. So I'm super excited about it. Um, and uh, going on the show was a great experience, even though it was a little bit contentious at times, and you know kind of uh, kind of intense. Um, I, I definitely enjoyed going on the program and it was a great experience for me to have. And, and to get on the show, did you just take the approach of emailing a lot of people or was, uh, did you know someone? How, how, what was the process of getting on the show? Um, Shark Tank has actually, has actually uh, asked me a number of times to be on the program, not me, but Rumpel. They've, they've inquired about Rumpel being on the program a number of times. Um, I actually went back through my email fairly recently. And uh, I have an email from, you know, five years ago from the casting crew at, at uh, Shark Tank asking if Rumpel would be interested. And I always sort of thought that, that this isn't necessarily a good fit for Shark Tank. Generally, I see companies go on Shark Tank that have some very protectable idea and they show up with their, you know, legal protections in hand and say, I'm the only one that can do this thing. So you should invest in me because there's gonna be no competition. Rumpel doesn't have that at all. I mean, Rumpel is very subject to, par to parity. Um, and there's very little we can protect. So I just thought, you know, if I go on here, they're going to just completely, you know, crush me because I don't have any protections on what I'm doing. And why can't a competitor come in and do lower price? And the answer is they can, a, a competitor could do that. Um, so I've, I'd always thought that it was kind of the wrong, the wrong fit for the show, but this most recent time, um, the, the casting director shared with me that, um, there's a lot of businesses that have become very successful after going on shark tank. And, um, so now the, the program is like almost this engine for for companies to gain a lot of legitimacy and gain a lot of traction and so they were actually trying to bring in more businesses that had a couple of years of positive revenues and were legitimate businesses in advance of going on the program to further boost legitimacy of the program as this platform for other businesses to gain more traction so i thought that positioning was really interesting and i thought all right rumble does have you know some some good results and i can bring these to the program and share them and that might also interest the sharks too, which it did. So 
um, the, the sort of the, the how they positioned going on the program was uh, was a lot uh, more in line with how I viewed the company and what I thought would be a good opportunity for Rumpel. So that's a long answer, but basically I didn't I didn't reach out to Shark Tank. They contacted me, and um, I went through the you know the usual casting process, a lot of over the phone, a lot of video calls and everything um, with the with the casting team. And ultimately, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make good TV, right? So if they if they think that you're going to be entertaining, you're a good fit for the show. Um, and so that's that's how I got on. I think I think it may have also been, and I don't know if this was the case, but uh, in the COVID period, you know, there's probably a lot more competition for them uh, because you know people people have a lot more choices. Uh, so maybe maybe that's part of the reason also they want to have like tried and true entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe um, was there like a post show? Did you see um, a significant boost in sales because of that? We did see a boost in sales. It wasn't a really significant boost in sales. Um, okay, I, I've talked to a number of of other founders and and business owners that have been on the program, and they saw really large spikes in their sales after the show aired. Um, that also, I think, could be because they were much smaller businesses before going on the show. You know, Rumpel is already sort of at some some scale, um, not huge scale, but we're already at some scale where the spike and the, and the demand created from Shark Tank was not that drastically different than the type of demand we we generate on a you know a normal week. Um, so it was definitely a spike. We got a lot of new eyeballs on the brand, but it wasn't like 20x a normal day or you know something like that. Can you share a little bit about your sales channels? Um, are you e-commerce only or are you also in retail stores? Are you on Amazon? Yeah, we're, we're an omni-channel business. So we're sold through traditional wholesale channels as well as Amazon. Um, right now, our business is about 55 to 60% uh, e-commerce. Um, and then the rest is made up through uh, U.S. wholesale, inter some international distribution, Amazon. And then we also have a, a corporate custom channel. So um, you know, if, if your company would want to get 50 rumples for the employees with your, with your logo branded on there, we do that as well. So when, when you started growing from the beginning, like, did you, from, for the business aspect of it, I, I assume there, there, there was a lot of learning for you, or did you get that by hiring more experienced people, like growing the sales channels and, and all these different things? We've done both. I would say the vast majority has been learning on the fly. Um, we've definitely hired people that are more experienced before to lead certain initiatives in the company. Um, I would say that uh, one of the key factors to our success has just been surrounding ourselves with good mentors and advisors that can that can really help us. Um, and uh, being open to hearing feedback. Um, I think that a lot of people think they know everything and, and uh, reject feedback or advice. Um, that's never been the case with Rumble. We, we always welcome feedback from people that know a lot more than we do. Um, and yeah, I mean, generally speaking, we've we've kind of learned on the fly ourselves. Okay. Um, which marketing channels work really well for you, uh, given that you're like 55% e-commerce? Mm -hmm. Well, our marketing, I mean, we, we, have, we have marketing that serves all channels, of course. But um, if you're talking about channel-specific marketing, um, I mean, I, I'd have to point to Facebook, Instagram. That's that's where we invest the most money. Uh, we see the best returns there. Um, it's a pretty essential part of our business. If we're talking about wholesale, we have a big fixture program where if an account buys a certain amount, we give them a free fixture. That secures some branded space in that store. It also does a really good job educating the customer about what the product is that they're looking at. Um, so we have different marketing initiatives by channel, but for our, our direct business, for sure, Facebook, Instagram is, is the most lucrative and the most important. And that would be ad or just the organic? That would be ads. Yeah. So, so paid direct response advertising. Okay. And that brings me to my next uh, question. What does your marketing team look like? Is it all in-house or do you work with agencies that, that do your uh, ads and things like that? A little bit of both. Um, the core team is is in house, um, so we've got uh, a fairly lean team. There's a uh, if you include e commerce and creative, which we sort of roll up into marketing. There's about six or seven people internally that are doing it. We also manage um, an an external PR agency, an external digital marketing agency that does all of our Facebook and and Instagram and and uh, Google ads and everything, all those placements. Uh, we also work with an SEO agency. 
um, and a handful of other things here and there, but uh, the, the core team uh, that's internal at Rumpel is fairly lean. One thing that I was very curious about, you know, when I looked at your Instagram page, all the images were, you know, mostly outdoor images and in, in really beautiful nature, natural settings. Um, can you share a little bit about what that process is like? Do you have like dedicated people who go out, take trips, have models who 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 pose with these blankets and and take the photos, or um, how how do you how do you manage that? So we do have an in-house photographer. Um, I I not so jokingly will often say that I think he has the best job at Rumpel. Um, he gets to go on trips and bring product and go to amazing places and shoot photos. Um, and yeah, we we pull from a, a pool of talent of models that we work with on a regular basis. Um, and uh, and so that's how a lot of the content is generated. Additionally, we have a really strong UGC engine, user user generated content. Um, so the products we make happen to lend themselves really well to people taking photos. Um, and we often get sent those photos or tagged in those photos. And we simply reach out and ask if we can use them. And if we get approval, we do. Sometimes we pay for content as well that people send us or, or offer to sell us. Um, but it's it's been, that's been a critical aspect to Rumpel is the content, um, whether it's done in-house or externally uh, or through our customers. Um, it's it's been really essential to building the brand and kind of the the energy behind the brand that we've been able to establish. Um, a little bit about uh, shipping and fulfillment. Uh, given that you're selling in multiple countries, um, how much of it is in-house versus outsourced, and uh, are there any any challenges that you face in shipping and fulfillment aspects of things? Yeah, there are definitely challenges we face. I mean, um, whether it's uh, sort of factors out of our control, like this this past fourth quarter, there was a huge surge in, in e-commerce business happening globally uh, that backed up supply chains, that backed up warehouses, that backed up shipping carriers. Um, so we felt that for sure, like a lot of other businesses did. We use a 3PL to, to do all of our uh, logistics and fulfillment. Uh, they also handle all of our returns, um, thir third-party logistics for, for anybody listening that doesn't know. Yep. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the factors, a lot of the challenges that we experience are external. Sometimes there are internal ones as well. Um, if, if something, you know, breaks uh, or um, something isn't entered into the system correctly, that can cause some challenges. Um, but yeah, shipping, shipping and fulfillment is, is really tough. Um, and I would say it's, where our operations team spends the majority of their time for sure is making sure that all those things are buttoned up and continue to work and continually checking on them and whenever whenever possible automating things but also there's just a lot of manual work that goes into that so it's very very complicated and frankly it's not a part of the business that that i spend a lot of time on we have a, a really talented operations team um, that's led by our vice president of operations he's one of the first employees from rumple and uh, he's done a great job with that. And, um, you know, they're always trying to improve and, and it's like, it's, it's either working or it's not working. And when it's not working, it's really a big deal. Um, and when it is working, they probably don't get enough credit from, uh, from the rest of the team or the customers for making that complicated system work. As, as a CEO, what, what kind of things do you, can you share a little bit about your mindset, your thought process, you know, running a company, growing a company, uh, what are the things that you focus most on and, and how do you manage your personal life versus business life? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd, I'd start by saying that I think this has been a big learning process for me. I was never a CEO before Rumble. In fact, I had really very little experience with management at all. Um, and so starting Rumble and you know now having a bunch of employees and, and growing the business and everything, that's all been very, very new to me. So I'm definitely learning on the go and I certainly don't want to uh, paint this picture of myself as this like amazing CEO that has all the answers because I'm still learning every single day. Um, but I would say that the biggest thing that I've learned over the last few years that I think has the biggest impact on the team and the performance of the team is real, it's a couple of things. I mean, first and foremost, I need to be really clear with my communication. Um, and I, and I need to try to do it um, just succinctly and, and clearly so that there's no ambiguity around what I'm saying or what I want done. Um, I think when, when I waffle between, you know, which direction I wanna go, that just creates confusion and really like 
freezes any action at the company. So it's really important, I think, for me to have a really clear and concise message to the team. That's one. Another is definitely as best I can trying to keep a level head. Um, there have been times at Rumpel where it's been really stressful and the results aren't coming in the way they should. And, and my uh, anxiety about it and my frustrations with it have, have come out and been more, um, you know, more public than, I, than they should be. And that doesn't do anything for getting the results back on track. It doesn't do anything for the morale of the team. It doesn't do anything for, for anybody. Um, so that's been a big learn of mine is to just try to keep myself as level-headed as possible, um, whether things are good or bad. Definitely celebrate the wins. You know, don't be like totally um, just just bland about any wins, but but make sure that when things aren't going well, that you keep a level head and, and you don't freak out too much. Um, and then a, a third one I would say is just really um, setting clear goals for yourself and for your team as best you can. That's obviously hard to do when your business is growing. There's a lot of different directions you can go in, but we use this great strategy framework. Um, it's not ours, but, but we borrowed the strategy framework called OGSM. Um, it stands for Objectives, Goals, Strategies, Measures. And um, I've worked really closely with our leadership team and our board to develop our objectives, which are like these big, you know, three-year goals that we want to have and that, or excuse me, objectives that we want to have. And then that ladders down to very measurable and specific goals that we want to achieve to get ourselves to those objectives. That further cascades down into strategies that we're going to implement to achieve those goals. And finally, from there, that that even further ladders down into really kind of like tactical measures that we try to take each week or quarter or month. Um, and by creating that really clear strategic framework, it allows the whole company to know what's what should be focused on. Um, and it also allows people top to bottom throughout the company to know how their work is impacting the bigger picture. If you're, if you're you know, the director of marketing and you know what the big objectives are, um, you know, you, you're gonna have a level of transparency to those objectives that maybe somebody in customer service or somebody that's more lower level might might not totally have. So creating this OGSM framework and sharing it with the team, walking them through it and having check-ins on it regularly and scoring yourself on it, that really allows the whole collective team to be focused and, and walking in the same direction towards those objectives. So that's been another really big thing. Um, realize this is a long-winded answer here, but I would say that the, the three things in summary are creating a clear strategic framework that you can share with the team so that they know what should be focused on, um, clear, concise messaging that's, that's, not, um, that's sort of final <laughs> without, without waffling. Um, you don't want to create any confusion by changing your, your mind. And then the third is doing your best job to keep a level head when things don't go to plan. And, and is it, uh, to me, it seems like you know, a lot of it is communicating and, and sharing what you know, a, a clear picture of vision and, and goals and things like that. Um, is it difficult to do that in the COVID world where, uh, you know, people are working remotely? Is it, has it, has it been challenging running your business uh, remotely? Some parts of the business have been really challenging and others have actually been easier in my experience. Um, in my role in particular, uh, you know, I often have to like address the whole company and tell them what it is we're working on and what we're focused on. And in a video call, there's actually a huge advantage I have. And then I can have my notes right in front of me and I can be reading those notes and still looking directly at everybody and presenting while toggling back and forth from the camera to my notes, which are an inch apart on my screen. Um, so that's been really helpful for a lot of things. You know, when we, we did, we, when COVID hit, we made some, some cost adjustments. Um, we rolled out like a really clear plan for the whole team. And there's no way I would have been able to remember every single line item on that plan if I was just going through that presentation live in person. So having those notes with me was super helpful. Um, that's, that's been easier. I think that the team definitely wants to, to see each other and be around each other. You know, we have, a, we have a fun group of people that work at Rumpel and they like hanging out. You know, people often go to the bar after work or go do stuff, you know, in their personal lives together. And I think definitely some of our team, um, you know, they, they miss being in the office. Um, and then additionally, the, the last thing is any product development is near impossible virtually. Um, our product is so tactile and you just, you got to get hands on it to know if we've picked the right material or to look at a print and see if the print, you know, resolution is coming out correctly. So that all has to be done in person. So um, we do meet periodically to go, go over product, we wear masks and do all the safety protocols and everything. Um, but that part of it absolutely does need to be done in person. And final question, uh, I know that entrepreneurship is, uh, is a challenging road, uh, 
there's there's you know failures and and setbacks along the way. Uh, what are one or two failures or setbacks in uh, that 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 stick out for you in your entrepreneurial journey, and what have you learned from that that and and how can other founders entrepreneurs uh, learn from those? Mm -hmm. um, I would go back to when we uh, changed our product over to post consumer recycle. Um, and in looking back on this in hindsight, it's it's so obvious, but in the moment, we just none of us really saw all these challenges that that we were going to face when we did that. The biggest of which was marketplace uh, cleanliness. So we had all of this what we would call 1.0 product, you know, product made with virgin materials out in the market, um, out at our retail accounts. Uh, and when we changed over to post consumer recycled, there was still a ton of it in the market that we had to clear. So we had to just do a huge amount of clearance activity with our retail accounts on our website. Amazon is flooded with all this 1.0 product that, that uh, you know, people were buying on discount and, and uh, eBay had the same issue. And that was just a big challenge for us. We, it, it really kind of um, you know, messed up our, our, our company margin. Um, we, were, we were not earning the types of profits that we should have been earning at that time. Um, and in hindsight, we should have, you know, maybe more gradually rolled out some of those changes rather than doing a hard cutoff. Um, now the, the market is clear and we're selling all post consumer recycled uh, product. And we think that it's a great move for the brand and we're really proud of it, but man, there was a, there was a very, very difficult, you know, half a year there where there was just a mix in the marketplace. And that, uh, that caused some major challenges in terms of messaging and pricing and all sorts of other things. Yeah. Uh, now we're going to move on to the rapid fire segment. Uh, and in yep. this segment, I'll look, I'm going to ask you a few questions and you have to answer them in one word or one sentence. So the first question is, do you have any book recommendations, uh, business entrepreneurship uh, in 2021 and why? Uh, the Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. An innovative you want explanation of why for any of these are just quick one, one words. Yeah, if you, if you have any, um, if you have a reason why you like that book, that would be great. Yeah. Sure. For, for that answer, for hard things about hard things, um, Ben Horowitz, who's one of the founding members of Andreessen Horowitz, one of the most successful VC firms on earth. Um, he just went through like just a brutal uh, path to, to becoming a successful entrepreneur, just massive volatility in the valuation of his business, a lot of big moves he had to make. Um, and the challenges he dealt with and, and was successful in navigating uh, make the ones that I've dealt with, at least in my career so far, just completely pale in comparison. And yeah, I mean, I, I, and one of the questions that I have here is, you know, uh, maybe I didn't send, send this to you, is, you know, do you believe in luck? Do you think that, you know, some, some of these people who get really, really successful, you know, is it, is it a coincidence uh, in their life or, or is it pure uh, hard work? Uh, there, there's an old saying, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically luck is preparation meets opportunity. Um, and so if you're not prepared for the opportunity to come, uh, you're just not going to get lucky. Um, there are definitely aspects of, of Rumpel's success that have been what some might call luck, um, you know, in terms of partnerships we've been able to strike or um, people we've been introduced to or kind of just finding the right, you know, being right place, right time. But um, if you ask anybody that works at Rumpel, they know we are just working our butts off all the time. And that's the preparation. So when that opportunity comes around, we're ready for it. Um, and so I, I would say that I, I believe in luck to some extent, but I, I don't think that you're going to, you should ever rely on it. And I don't think that most entrepreneurs that have been successful have done so by luck. An innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce, retail, or tech landscape that you feel excited about? Uh, we just onboarded actually a, a platform called Envoy B2B. Um, this okay. is a platform that connects you, connects you on the brand side with your reps and your wholesale accounts. Uh, that's always been a big challenge for us and, and for a lot of businesses that do wholesale is making sure the accounts have the right uh, catalogs, the right marketing support, the right pricing, all this stuff. And historically, it's been like a very manual analog way of doing things where you send them physical assets or, or you send them a folder of assets or something. 
digitally that they need to use to help market your product. But this is like a full platform where you can do that in app and it really helps communication between the brand and the account. Uh, a business or, or productivity tool uh, or, or productivity tip that you would recommend? I would recommend this OGSM framework I told you about. Um, okay. That's been totally transformational for our business, and uh, it's we're not we're not letting go of that anytime. It's been it's been amazing for us. A startup or business that you think is currently doing great things? Uh, I would say this is actually more of a category, but I would say the outdoor furniture category is very ready for disruption in e-commerce. Um, there are two businesses, at least that I know of, that are that are really kind of leading the way here. And one is called High Neighbor, and or just Neighbor, I guess. And one is called Outer. Um, and and Neighbor in particular is um, is built by some former Tuft and Needle uh, uh, directors or, or or leadership level folks, uh, and they're really tackling this issue with the same like problem solution that the whole mattress in a box revolution uh, came out of, which is like Outdoor furniture is a, is a pain to go look at in person. Showrooms are this dated, expensive model of doing things. Shipping is really challenging. Quality is iffy. Um, you know, costs are way too high. So, so I think that outdoor furniture is the next big category that's gonna, that's gonna make its way into e-commerce in a major way. A final question, uh, a peer entrepreneur or business person uh, whom you look up to or someone who inspires you? Uh, Peter Deering is, uh, he's the CEO of a company called Peak Design. He's a friend. Um, he, he started Peak Design roughly at the same time Rumpel got started, uh, also in San Francisco. Um, he's managed to build into a really successful business with, without taking any outside money, um, which is really impressive, impressive in and of itself. He also has really prioritized doing the right thing from a company standpoint, um, you know, giving back making sure that they're building products with sustainable components. Um, it would seem he treats his employees really well. He's got really clear vision and, and clear communication style. Um, and yeah, I would say I would say Peter is a good one. Okay, those were all the questions that I had today, Wiley. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for sharing your story and for sharing all the business insights. Uh, now is the time if you would like to share your um, website you know how people can buy your products and things like that please go ahead sure uh you can buy our products from our website which is rumple.com r-u-m-p-l.com uh, we also are sold in a number of wholesale accounts you can find a dealer locator on that website um, some of the bigger ones i'd just like to shout out are rei uh, shields nordstrom backcountry.com uh, and then there's just a whole handful of others that you can find on our website if you're looking to get hands on the product before purchasing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wiley, for, for uh, coming on the show, for sharing your story, for sharing all the different business insights. I really, really appreciate your time and, and uh, for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.